Hello students, Merry Christmas and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be proceeding with the third video of the Justify series. In our earlier videos, we covered these topics. All right, you can watch those videos and you can then get along with these topics. But today we will be dealing with these. Now the timestamps are also given so that you can actually scroll to the part of the video if any answer is known to you because we are now revising and our time is very valuable, right? So we will start right away with the first one that is glutathione plays a vital role in detoxification. Now the answer lies in two parts. Number one, glutathione is an agent of phase two conjugation of xenobiotics reaction, right? Glutathione is composed of glutamine, cysteine and glycine and it's the cysteine residue that helps in conjugation of all heavy metals and toxins. Right, so glutathione is represented as GSH. So the cysteine residue of this GSH helps in conjugation and helps in detoxification. That is number one. And number two, you also need to mention that glutathione is an antioxidant and helps detoxifying all the reactive oxygen species. Right? How does it act? So glutathione reduced glutathione will be converted to oxidized glutathione that is known as GSS G. All right and this H will be donated to all the peroxides that will be converted to water all right now there is another step prior to this all right uh, that is this glutathione is itself reduced by NADPH right and that itself is an answer to another explain why type of question that will be soon featured in the channel that is how uh, G6PD glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency leads to membrane hemolysis right in when oxidative drugs are applied to the system anyway we are not discussing about all that so in case of glutathione you need to mention in a two part number one xenobiotics phase two conjugation any heavy metals electrophiles actually conjugates with the cysteine residue of glutathione and number two glutathione being an antioxidant it donates its H plus when it's converted from reduced to oxidized state and that H plus tackles all the free radicals and also prevents a reactive oxygen species damage right so number one phase two conjugation and number two antioxidant role thus via a dual role glutathione plays a vital role in detoxification the next one urinary urobilinogen is increased in hemolytic jaundice well it's very easy first you need to mention in case of hemolytic jaundice there is a hemolysis of rbc membrane and due to that all the hemoglobin is converted to bilirubin now in this case all the bilirubins are unconjugated variety normally in other type of jaundice obstructive jaundice or even in hepatocellular jaundice the urine is very uh, dark colored because of presence of conjugated bilirubin but in this case bilirubin is unconjugated and this unconjugated fraction of bilirubin is converted to urobilinogen and that urobilinogen will now be excreted in urine therefore in hemolytic jaundice also the urine will be very dark colored okay it may look like as if uh, blood is coming out in urine but it is actually urobilinogen so the answer is very simple in hemolytic jaundice there is excess of unconjugated bilirubin in blood and that unconjugated bilirubin will be converted to urobilinogen normally also urobilinogen is excreted in urine but in case of hemolytic jaundice this urobilinogen will be very 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 high so since urobilinogen is produced from unconjugated bilirubin since unconjugated bilirubin is high in hemolytic jaundice therefore urinary urobilinogen is increased in hemolytic jaundice so in this context you need to remember that there is no bilirubinemia in case of hemolytic jaundice because unconjugated bilirubin is not soluble in urine so that bilirubin reaches gut all right intestine and it's over there that urobilinogen is formed and then it is reabsorbed and that is excreted in urine. The next one, allopurinol is used as an anti-gout drug. This is an enzymology question, right? Allopurinol in vivo, that is in body, is converted to allozanthine. Allozanthine, right? This allozanthine acts as a competitive inhibitor of the enzyme xanthine oxidase all right in production of uh, in degradation of purine you know where the reaction where uric acid is produced this is the enzyme xanthine oxidase right 
if excess purine is produced in the body due to high protein diet or any other causes that will lead to excess uric acid production, hyperuricemia and gout. So this is the key enzyme and we need to target this enzyme. Now allopurinol does that. So your answer should consist of two keyword. Number one, competitive inhibitor of the enzyme xanthine oxidase and the active principle being allopurinol in vivo that is in body is converted to allozanthine that allozanthine is actually the competitive inhibitor or substrate analog for the enzyme xanthine oxidase and thus it inhibits the enzyme xanthine oxidase uric acid production is hampered and thus it will act as an anti-gout drug next we look at why von Gerg's disease is characterized by hyperuricemia von Gerg's disease is a glycogen storage disorder and it is uh, characterized by glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency. What does glucose 6-phosphatase do? It actually converts glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. Just the reversal of hexokinase or glucokinase reaction, right? Now, if that enzyme is deficient, there will be excess accumulation of glucose 6-phosphate, right? So, this glucose 6-phosphate will now have to be metabolized by an alternative pathway right because uh, it cannot be converted to glucose which is the main fate of glucose 6-phosphate when we are dealing with catabolic reactions. So this glucose 6-phosphate is now metabolized by pentose phosphate pathway or HMP shunt right. So majority of the glucose 6-phosphate will be diverted to HMP shunt and you know the product of HMP shunt are purines and pyrimidines, pentoses. And those pentoses, when they are produced in excess, they are also degraded in excess. And I just discussed in the previous question that increased degradation of purines and pyrimidines will lead to production of uric acid. So you get my point? Glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency, glucose 6-phosphate accumulates, diverted to HMP shunt. Increased HMP shunt means increased production of pentoses that will lead to increased production of purines and pyrimidine nucleotides that will be degraded and that will lead to hyperuricemia. So von Gerg's disease is characterized by hyperuricemia, a very important explain why type of question. The next one why sucrose is also known as invert sugar. What is inversion? Inversion is the phenomena that is noticed when an aqueous solution of sucrose gradually turns the direction of plane polarized light from dextrorotatory to levorotatory, right? Dextrorotatory is denoted by plus some value of an angle and levorotatory is generally denoted by minus angle. Now sucrose as we know is a non-reducing disaccharide that is comprising of units, monosaccharide units, glucose and fructose. When we first take an aqueous solution of sucrose, it is dextrorotatory in nature this the specific rotation is around 62.5 plus 62.5 now the constituents glucose is a dextrorotatory agent plus 55 degree is the optical rotation of glucose however fructose is strongly levorotatory its uh, rotation is minus 92 degree however the aqueous solution to start with behaves as a dextrorotatory solution but when this is hydrolyzed so remember, a hydrolyzed solution of sucrose is actually known as invert sugar. So when hydrolyzed, this thing, the levorotatory component of fructose, strongly levorotatory component generally takes over. So slowly, the optical rotation of the solution changes from plus 55 to minus 19 degree, right? 19.7 to be precise. That's why with time, we notice that initially the solution is dextrorotatory. When hydrolyzed, the solution slowly starts turning the direction of plane polarized light from positive to zero and then all the way to minus 19 degree. So the original dextrorotatory solution becomes a levorotatory solution. That phenomena is known as inversion and that is why sucrose is also known as invert sugar. And lastly, why glycine cannot rotate plane polarized light, right? We know that all amino acids other than glycine has got a structure like this. There is a central carbon atom, there is a COH group, there is an amino group, there is a hydrogen and there is a side chain, R. 
that is true for all other amino acid other than glycine. So, this carbon in the center behaves as an optically active or chiral carbon atom. All chiral carbon atom has got a property, optical property of rotating plane polarized light. However, in case of glycine which has got the simplest structure, this R is actually replaced by hydrogen. There is no other side chain. The side chain is an hydrogen atom. So, now in this case what happens? The two molecule of hydrogen are attached to a carbon atom. So, we all know a chiral carbon atom is such a carbon atom where four different compounds or different groups are attached to the four different bonds. The moment two hydrogen atoms are attached, now this behaves as an achiral. This is no longer an optically active compound. So, glycine is not an optically active compound. It has got no chiral carbon atom. The central carbon atom is achiral. That is why it cannot rotate plane polarized light. So, students that is it for today. Feel free to ask any such explain why that you are finding difficult to answer in the comment section. I will surely make a video by compiling all your questions and suggestions. So, I wish you all a Merry Christmas once again and I will see you soon with the next video. Till then, bye and take care.